Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, July 6th, we discussed the Supreme Court's decision in Americans for Prosperity versus Bonta, Attorney General of the State of California. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Mr. Eric Jaffe, Eric is a partner at Share Jaffe LLP, where he focuses his practice on appellate litigation on a wide range of First Amendment issues. Eric is also the chairman of the Federalist Society's Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group Executive Committee. After our speaker gives his opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. So be thinking of those as we go along. If you have a question, please enter it, and you can actually enter it at any time at the bottom of the screen in the chat or the Q&A function. So again, if you have a question, please enter it in either one of those features. With that, thank you for being with us today. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you uh, glad to participate once again about this, I think, fairly important case on First Amendment rights, uh, particularly the freedom of association uh, and particularly the anonymous freedom of anonymous association. So in Americans for Prosperity versus Bonta and Thomas More Law Society versus Bonta, uh, the court held by a, mostly by a six to three, sometime a five to four decision that uh, California's policy, the Department of California Department of Justice's policy uh, of requiring disclosure of the charitable donors to uh, nonprofits that solicit donations in California uh, violated the First Amendment because it was not narrowly tailored to serve uh, the state's claimed interest and because it imposed a burden on organizations and donors in general. This decision was interesting and a little bit fractured for a variety of reasons. Um, in the first instance, it was fractured on what standard of scrutiny should apply. So Chief Justice Roberts writing for the majority for most of the time uh, had one section, part 2B, joined only by himself and two other justices, so writing only for three justices, that said exacting scrutiny applied. Now, for those of you who follow First Amendment law, there's a whole bunch of different tiers of scrutiny. There's strict scrutiny, which is supposedly really serious. There's exacting scrutiny, which is sort of kind of mostly serious, except when we don't want it to be. Uh, and then there's intermediate scrutiny, which we apply to things like um, commercial speech, which is supposed to be less exacting and less significant, but in fact, as a practical matter, often turns out to be more exacting than exacting scrutiny. It just sort of depends again on who, what you have for breakfast and, and whether you like the speech involved. Uh, and then there's sort of normal rational basis scrutiny that applies when um, you know there's no real First Amendment burden at all. So it's not really any scrutiny at all. It's just sort of baseline due process scrutiny. But here, Chief Justice Roberts and two other justices held that this sort of high middle standard of exacting scrutiny applied uh, and that exacting scrutiny applied, required, first of all, that there be a, a, a means end fit at the front end between the breadth of the burden you impose or the breadth of your restriction, forget the burden, the breadth of your restriction and the interest that you claim to be serving. And, and then after that, we would decide whether or not the burden you imposed upon free speech uh, how that was relative to the benefits that you claim, the strength of the benefits versus the strength of the burdens. Uh, and that was interesting. And it set down a nice rule that said means end comes first and then weighing the benefits versus the burdens comes second. And I think that's very helpful to the extent that that gets applied going forward. But like I said, only three justices joined that. Uh, the other two, the other three justices who concurred in the result and in many parts of the rest of the opinion, however, would have applied even stricter scrutiny. They would have applied either strict scrutiny or potentially, uh, you know, exacting scrutiny in some cases and strict in others. So Justice Thomas, uh, who joined the result, uh, would have applied strict scrutiny full out. And so this is the, this exacting scrutiny standard is the minimum he would have applied. Uh, and obviously, if it fails this, it fails strict scrutiny. Uh, justices Alito and Gorsuch wouldn't have decided 
the question of which level of scrutiny. They might have applied exacting scrutiny, but they weren't ready to say that yet. But they were confident uh, with the court's majority that this standard would certainly fail the exacting scrutiny level and would then definitely fail the strict scrutiny level. So they found no need to reach the question of what level of scrutiny. So again, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' standards for exacting scrutiny at least set the minimum for six different justices. And some justices would have gone further. It doesn't set the maximum level of scrutiny, but it certainly sets the minimum level of scrutiny. And for folks who like the First Amendment, care about the First Amendment, and thinks these disclosure requirements are um, burdensome and often targeted and often disingenuous, like me, uh, this is a good thing. These are good tests. Um, Roberts, however, rejects strict scrutiny, and that part of his opinion uh, does not have a majority. So that part of an opinion can't be uh, considered a holding, though I think one could consider it a holding to say, at a minimum, there's exact scrutiny. Then uh, moving on to the application of exacting scrutiny, that was joined by six justices in general. Um, all six justices agreed that if exacting scrutiny applied and not some something more aggressive, uh, that certainly this would fail. And that was a, a good, interesting analysis. They talked about exacting scrutiny, says it has to be narrowly tailored, even if not the least restrictive means. Uh, that substantial relationship to the goals that you have in mind was not enough. Uh, and that fit matters. And those are all welcome things for people who litigate in this area from the First Amendment side, that fit matters because most courts and certainly the Ninth Circuit would sort of wave their hand and say it's close enough for government work and they would never really test the fit between the means and the ends uh, of some disclosure requirement, much less many other types of requirements. So that was sort of fun. That was sort of interesting. It was nice to see the court, a uh, six person majority of the court, sort of say that fit matters. Uh, and while there was some debate over how this fit in with precedent and some debate between the dissent and the majority over whether this was an expansion or a, a not faithful application of earlier precedent, the answer at the end of the day is earlier precedent was not exactly a model of clarity. Uh, I think Justice Sotomayor called it nuanced. I would call it hopelessly messed up. Um, that's nuanced in the sense of how do I feel this morning nuanced? Uh, did I have cabbage for breakfast uh, and I'm feeling a little off uh, nuanced? But anyway, it's, it's nice to have a brighter line drawn that tells you what exacting scrutiny applies pretty much across the board in any kind of challenge to disclosure requirements. And that's nice. Um, so there you go on, on the application. Then we get to part three of his decision which is sort of the, uh, he, you know, he finds that it's not narrowly tailored. He finds that there's a dramatic mismatch between the interest claimed by, by California and the disclosure requirement they use to achieve that interest. And then Chief Justice Roberts goes on to find that this analysis applies to the, to the rule. It's not a statute, it's a DOJ rule uh, or internal policy um, that, that the policy on its face violates the First Amendment because of this dramatic mismatch across the board. And that was a facial holding that I think many people didn't expect. I certainly didn't expect that. I thought they might stop at, um, at an as-applied challenge to these petitioners. But in fact, they went further. And that holding had the concurrence of five justices. Justice Thomas did not join that part of the decision that this should be struck down on its face. Uh, for reasons that I'll get into in a minute, but he thought that went too far and he would have limited it just to an as-applied decision. Uh, the three dissenters wouldn't have even given the as-applied decision, though they claim to be more sympathetic to that, though that claim is hard to reconcile with their, their actual writings. But, but at least, you know, it's sort of curious, uh, had there been enough votes for an as-applied ruling, I wonder whether the dissenters would have joined in that ruling just to get a solid majority and a limitation on facial challenges. But given that there weren't enough to get there, at most there were only four to reject the facial challenge, uh, perhaps the dissenters just felt the need to fully dissent rather than only dissent as to the part that Justice Thomas dissented to, uh, which is part 3B, or one of the parts Justice Thomas dissented to. Um, I personally think that the five justice majority uh, on the uh, facial challenge was right. I think that the burden of requiring disclosure uh, of donations uh, is on its face, burdensome of First Amendment rights. I personally view their analysis that says just because some donors don't care uh, doesn't make a difference because those donors aren't anonymous 
And so the state has plenty of access to those donors and it doesn't need to require the disclosure of the, 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 for, the Schedule Bs that it was demanding. So I found this whole debate about, well, lots of people are happy to say that they donated to X charity or Y charity to be somewhat of a misplaced debate in that, well, those donors aren't private in the first place and anybody could find their, their donations by looking up on the website. There's no reason to worry about that. It is obviously just the donors who are anonymous. So, so of course, only anonymous donors care about having their anonymity breached, uh, uh, and that is fine. Uh, there was also some further debate in connection with this about whether or not, whether or not one should sort of require proof at the front end that people would be deterred, proof at the front end that lots of donors would face a risk. I mean, the individual charities involved in these cases, the Thomas More Law Society and Americans for Prosperity Foundation, they in fact had proof that their employees, that their donors had gotten harassed and threatened. Uh, there was plenty of proof of that. Uh, and, and to my mind, that proof was enough uh, that anybody seeking anonymity to any kind of group that, that even plausibly could trigger people to be pissed or plausibly could get attacks on who those donors are, uh, had ample reason to want anonymity on its face. The dissent would have taken a different view. But anyway, uh, Justice Roberts ultimately uh, analyzes all this, finds that the state's interests uh, were burdensome just across the board, that the, state, the state's means were burdensome across the board, that their interests were ultimately disingenuous, that they never actually used these, these mass-produced uh, Form 9, Form Schedule Bs, for law enforcement purposes in any meaningful situation, and that they're only doing it for ease of administration on the off chance that at some future point, they might need something. Uh, and of course, it's worth remembering that the state can always get these through a targeted request for disclosure. It's just, we're just talking about uh, en masse disclosure for people who were not under suspicion at all, and the state had no other basis other than creating a pool of donor information uh, that it could go fishing in whenever it decided it wanted to. Uh, and of course, that kind of stuff is a uh, suspect at best, but there you have it. Um, anyway, so, so uh, J Chief Justice Roberts finds all of these factors, finds all of these threats and says, at the end of the day, we don't have to prove that every, every uh, charity would be affected or every donor would be affected, just that there was a substantial number of unconstitutional applications and that was enough for an overbreath challenge and that this statute was overbroad in the means that it sought to use to police charities so to speak even the, and, and that wasn't even sort of true uh, so the overbreath part is where justice thomas gets off the boat uh and says i'm not on board with overbreath as a means of facial invalidation even though there's a decently long history in the first amendment context of using overbreath challenges to strike down laws on their face Justice Thomas, uh, in his decision, wouldn't have gone that far. He would have stopped at the as applied challenge, and I'll get to his reasoning in a few moments. Um, so, but but I, I actually think this is consistent with past law. I actually think overbreath doctrine is good doctrine and has a substantial basis, if not squarely in First Amendment text, certainly in First Amendment history, and definitely in due process. Uh, and, and we'll talk about how due process and First Amendment sort of have been sort of rolled into each other uh, in, in a lot of First Amendment cases. And I think that's really where this comes from. Uh, and, and that's why I disagree with Justice Thomas to some degree. Anyway, uh, given that there's a substantial number of unconstitutional applications and the risk of chilling in lots of other situations, Chief Justice Roberts would have struck down the entire thing. He spent some time rejecting the notion that it's the plaintiff burden of proof in every instance to show that they would have been chilled and their donors have been scared away, uh, and therefore you can't have a facial challenge. Uh, he points out that the individual burdens on donors only apply after you have upheld, upheld a statute on its face, not before you have resolved the facial challenge. And I think he is exactly right. And if you look at cases like Buckley, I think he is exactly right. Buckley rejected a facial challenge because there was a means ends fit and then said, but we'll make an exception if you can prove that you're uniquely burdened. And I think it's only in those exception cases that the burden rests with the charity rather than the burden being on the state to prove that their interest is served in a meaningful way and to prove that they're narrowly tailored. So I very much like that part of his opinion. I like the fact that he clarifies the burdens at the different stages of challenges, facial versus as applied. 
Um, and I think he, quite frankly, is exactly right. So moving on to the concurrences, Justice Thomas concurred. Uh, uh, he would have taken a different approach in three different ways. One, he would have applied strict scrutiny, as I mentioned before. But at least that is, he just would have gone further than the majority. But, at a, but I, I, I gather recognizes the majority's uh, exacting scrutiny standard uh, is the minimum, and he just would have had strict scrutiny, which would have been much more easy to strike down individual applications of uh, these kinds of disclosure requirements. Second, he rejects overbreath doctrine as a general matter. He thinks uh, that the court has no power at all to enjoin lawful applications of a statute just because other applications would be unlawful, and he thinks it raises standing problems. The notion of you as an individual plaintiff who the law could be applied to theoretically, uh, raising the concerns of other people to whom the law could not be applied to. And I understand those concerns and I think those concerns are interesting, uh, but I disagree that they're standing issues. There's no question that you are burdened. And the question is just because they could have written a better law that would have caught you, but not other people, doesn't mean that you aren't burdened by this law. And I find actually that overbreath doctrine is actually just a, 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 a special case application of things like void for vagueness and due process and fair notice concerns where a statute that lacks uh, clarity and specificity just because you could have written a better statute and therefore you could have been caught by that better statute if there wasn't such a statute or a policy in this case, uh, then you can't get caught by a vague statute that could have been done better. I find those to be special applications of due process. I generally think that things like due process and equal protection apply with heightened rigor when, the cons when they interact with another constitutional consideration, such as, say, race discrimination or so First Amendment burdens or Second Amendment burdens, for that matter. I think that when you have the intersection of due process in the, in the burdening of some other constitutional, substantive constitutional right, those procedural due process concerns like vagueness, like fair warning, all take on a heightened rigor. And that's what I think of as, as overbreath. And I think the court was exactly right to do this. And I think they're standing for those things. And I don't think an application of an overbroad law to somebody who could have been caught by, an, by, by a properly written law is actually a lawful application at all. It's a theoretically lawful application of some other law that wasn't written. Uh, and I think there are all kinds of related problems in the due process world, not the least of which is the improper delegation of authority to law enforcement by writing a vague statute. So you can imagine a statute that says, well, go forth and stop all crime, anything that would be bad, feel free to stop. And that statute on its face uh, is grossly overbroad, improperly delegates, doesn't give any fair warning. You have no idea who that would apply to, even though I'm a murderer and you're using it to stop me. That would be my view. So I, I depart from Justice Thomas, despite having uh, a tremendous respect for his concern and obviously tremendous agreement with him on many other issues, um, but, but just not this one. Uh, and his final one is he would have rejected uh, facial challenges to statutes at all on similar grounds to the overbreath concern, viewing it as an advisory opinion, uh, suggesting that even if you suspect that this result will recur over and over and over again in, all, in many other applications, even in all other applications of laws, he um, would have said, nope, you just have to apply it in those future things and the precedent will apply uh, and that will be that. And I, once again, think that that... Uh, ignores some of the due process concerns, ignores the delegation concerns, and I think underweights the concern that government officials can go forth and then chase you down, even though they know that in a virtually analogous situation, uh, it, it was unconstitutional, they can go after you and force you to relitigate it again and again and again. It just encourages government obstructionism, uh, which I think is offensive, I think is a violation of due process, and I think unduly burdens people, particularly in a world where we don't, where we have qualified immunity. Uh, if we didn't have qualified immunity, we can actually go after those prosecutors for prosecuting terrible unconstitutional uh, claims against people just because you don't have a facial challenge anymore. Uh, well, yeah, then that might deter people from bringing uh, sort of BS uh, things just because there wasn't a facial strike down. It might deter this sort of constant resistance you get to certain Supreme Court rulings by places like, not shockingly, California, uh, which has shown shockingly little respect for the Constitution, or at least for the Constitution as applied by the U.S. Supreme Court. When it disagrees with the U.S. Supreme Court, California, and particularly the Ninth Circuit, but lots of California courts just go their own way and figure, you know, too bad, so sad. The Supreme Court can't get around to reversing us all the time. So let's just be 
do what we want. And I think Justice Thomas's argument about facial challenges, getting rid of facial challenges, would just encourage that kind of behavior even more uh, and would make it almost impossible to enforce against that kind of obstructionism. So once again, I disagree with him on that, but he makes interesting points about advisory opinions, but I would just find those laws violate delegation concerns, equal protection concerns, due process concerns, uh, even though they're done in the context of the First Amendment. Uh, the other concurrence for by Justice Alito, joined by Justice Gorsuch, uh, just would have sort of deferred the question of strict versus exacting scrutiny, like I just mentioned above, but finding that exacting scrutiny is more than enough to strike this down, felt that there was no need to say that that's the, the standard for all time. And they would have left open the question about what standard of scrutiny applies in any given instance, including in this type of situation uh, and others. Uh, but that again, at least sets a minimum basis. Finally, the dissent uh, by Justice Sotomayor for herself and uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Kagan, I, I think would have sort of said, this is fine across the board. Any concern with public disclosure that happened in the past because the DOJ, the California DOJ was lax and negligent and irresponsible and incompetent uh, has been cured by their promises to do better in the future. <laughs> and so no need to worry about the public attacking you. It's just the DOJ that gets your information now. Uh, I think she would have discounted any risk of danger from the DOJ itself retaliating against you, uh, evidence of which was in the record, um, though not relied upon by the majority opinion in this case. So at least there's a fair debate about that. It's not like I uh, disagree with her that the majority didn't rely on that, but I do disagree with her that there wasn't evidence that the DO California DOJ took this evidence and used it for their own nefarious purposes, not just simply by leaking it to outsiders who would harass people. But that California itself has a long history of harassing and disclosing <laughs> and breaking the law regarding <laughs> uh, donor information like this. Uh, and in past examples and past uh, situations, particularly the defensive marriage situations and stuff like that. So uh, she also would have sort of rejected the facial invalidity challenges that the, the majority applied. Uh, for reasons different, largely different than Justice Thomas, she thinks that there is an individual plaintiff burden of proof in every case to show that not only would they be burdened, but that all other charities would be burdened and that lots of donors would be burdened and would not contribute. And she would put that almost impossible burden of proof onto plaintiffs, effectively dooming any facial challenge to disclosure requirements, because even if you could show it for you and fellow travelers of your political stripe, or, or social stripe, you probably couldn't show it for everybody. You couldn't show it for the opera house. You couldn't show it for the Feed the Hungry charities. You couldn't show it for all those other people. And so she would never, uh, by my reading of this, allow a facial challenge at all. She would only allow as applied challenges. And she would always put the burden of proof, a fairly substantial burden of proof on plaintiffs. I thoroughly disagree with that. Uh, there, I suppose, is a, a non, non, non-frivolous debate about whether uh, one should read past cases as requiring that. I actually think the better reading of past cases is that they require that only after upholding something on a facial challenge and that the burden of proof at the facial stage is on the state to prove its interest and to prove that its interest is substantially served by the means that is chosen and that those means do not have a grotesquely uh, unrealistic fit, that they don't catch a tiny bit of things by covering a million prophylactic situations. Uh, but 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 there's grounds for debate about what past cases said. Like I said, past cases, uh, she describes them generously as nuanced. I describe them ungenerously as a mess. Uh, and so I'm glad to have some clarity, even though it's not in the direction she would have preferred. Uh, that's just a disagreement, but she, she has a point about some of the past cases. I think a fair point. Um, some of the other aspects of the dissent uh, are just some, you know, different examples and different uh, sort of re-debating. Re Justice Roberts says re-litigating. Uh, I think she looks at the record and sort of says, look, there are lots of reasons why California might want this. Uh, I just thoroughly disagree with uh, the dissent on that, uh, on that point. I don't think California's claimed reasons for wanting all this information in a massive pool of available data for them to dip their toe in anytime they feel see the need uh, is actually true. As a factual matter, it's not true. As a, as a policy matter, it's not true. I think that there's just they're, they're incredibly disingenuous. And I think on the record below, California couldn't actually back this up to save their lives. Uh, so I'm a little disappointed that she sort of comes up with this wildly speculative 
grounds for California for needing this. They need all this information to avoid self-dealing. That's just silly. You don't need uh, Schedule B information to, to, to check for self-dealing. It doesn't really show you that. Uh, that. You need this information to avoid diversion of money, which is almost impossible to figure out how Schedule B information would help you check, detect diversion of money, which is not listed on Schedule B. It's not how you spent it. It's who gave it. But you know how much money the charities had in general. You just don't necessarily know who gave it to them. But if they were diverting it to go pay for trips to Tahiti, uh, that's a different schedule. That's a different spending problem. It's not a contribution problem. You certainly don't need to know who gave the money. Uh, comparisons across schedules, there wasn't a single example of that, as far as I could tell, where they hadn't gotten Schedule B at a later separate request once they had already suspected a particular charity of monkeying around. Uh, so, so I was a little disappointed with the factual debate that seemed to sort of take California at its word without putting them to any level of proof at all. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that what I like about the majority opinion, and even if it had gone stronger, and what I dislike about the dissenting view on this is that it would encourage courts like the Ninth Circuit to simply play monkey games with, with, with the facts, with the, the burdens of proof, like they do so routinely in First Amendment cases and Second Amendment cases, in any case where they don't seem to like the right at issue, but would agree with it. And, and you know, they have a terrible, terrible track record of doing that, uh, particularly in, in Second Amendment cases and certainly in campaign related cases and certainly in donor disclosure cases where they just massage the record and manipulate the record and just accept the most, the thinnest of justifications from the state to uphold what seems to me to be clear constitutional burdens. So it's nice that that hopefully won't happen as much in the future. It would be nice to see sort of real exacting scrutiny cross apply to other constitutional rights and to the consideration of other constitutional rights. Uh, and hopefully this could be one step in that direction. But uh, it's nice to rein in this sort of policy of obstruction from certain lower courts who just resist constitutional rights that they don't like. And so use this you know, balancing sliding scale scrutiny to avoid actually giving any weight at all to a express or implied constitutional rights uh, where it goes. And I think many of you could probably imagine constitutional rights that you don't like, where you're happy that courts do that. And I would say you shouldn't be so happy about that either, that you might not agree with the existence of a constitutional right, but we should all agree that once we have constitutional rights, uh, we should apply real scrutiny, not fake scrutiny. And we shouldn't leave it up to judges to pick and choose which rights and which which plaintiffs that they actually happen to like or dislike uh, for helping out with uh, malleable case by case, see how it goes kinds of standards. So that's my spiel on this case. I'm glad it came out the way it did. I suppose I should have pointed out earlier that I had a brief in this case on behalf of a couple of different clients. One was the uh, a group called Protect the First, which is a First Amendment oriented group. Another was the Pacific Research Institute. That they were the two amici on an amicus brief we filed. Uh, and so uh, obviously we had made the point that governments themselves are more than capable of retaliating against donors they can't stand or donors to their political enemies. And that public disclosure is not the only way donors are chilled and hurt. Uh, anyway, so with that, I think hopefully we'll open it to some questions and I'm happy to discuss some of the nuances or some of, if you disagree with some of my crazy views, that's fine too. Great, thank you so much for that. That was very interesting. And um, at this point, I would ask the audience if you have questions for Eric, please enter them into the chat or the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, while we're waiting for audience members to send in their questions, I'll just check to make sure no one has sent in a question yet. Um, I wanted to ask if you see any likely next steps for California. So since California's had, as you've mentioned, um, a penchant for going after organizations that they disagree with politically, what step do you think they're going to take now? I think they will enact a more targeted disclosure regime, but that the targeting will not be terribly narrow. Um, and so, you know, they'll find some things that sort of help with the means end fit. Uh, and my guess is they will minimize going after places that obviously don't care, uh, but they'll, they'll go, certainly go after people they don't like. Uh, they will focus more on political groups, groups that they somehow are suspicious of, 
that they think are passed through conduits for other folks to speak. Uh, I'm sure you will see this come closer and closer to sort of campaign related uh, or you know, public policy influencing related speech and they will assert an added interest in sort of making sure that people are not misleadingly uh, claiming to be an independent charity but have big donors who are sort of you know, seen across 10 charities or something like that. I, if I had a guess, that's where California goes, um, uh, but who knows? Uh, maybe they pass a statute and add a bunch of findings that they think get some legislative weight rather than having this just be the DOJ itself. But it's hard to imagine California actually giving up and saying, OK, we'll stop. We'll stop scaring off people we don't like, which is what they I think was the self-evident policy behind this DOJ action was let's scare all the folks we don't like by collecting all their donor information and auditing their donors occasionally and threatening to audit their donors and making everybody worry that we're going to audit their donors. I, I don't see any plausible story that that wasn't what was going on. But uh, I'm not sure that there's a definitive proof of that. But having litigated against California in lots of situations, let's just say they don't get the benefit of the doubt. The instinct of a litigator. I think that you have the, the prerogative to make that determination. Um, okay, next next question is from Jeffrey Wood. He asks, are there any sword as well as shield application of this when inappropriate information collection and or disclosures have occurred? So for example, federal disclosure of privileged tax information. Well, I mean, in the federal context, yes. Yeah, so, well, there's certainly sword applications. It's not about this decision. There's statutes that talk about it being a felony to, to improperly disclose information. I suppose if it was negligently disclosed, it would be harder to go after people. And maybe it's hard to prove that it was on purpose versus negligent. But there are some serious federal statutes that go to this. And, and at least according to Justice Sotomayor's opinion, there are some California rules that talk about uh, the consequences for disclosure, though it looked like the consequences were discipline, not actual criminal punishment. So you get a, a nasty note saying, shame on you, you, you got caught. <laughs> I don't think it's actually shame on you, you did it. I just think it's shame on you, you got caught. Um, but, but be that as it may, uh, perhaps California uh, adopts a more IRS-like um, regime where they at least threaten some penalties for improper disclosure. But remember, the disclosure to the public is not the only way that governments use information. And for, for those out there who, you know, many of you out there may agree with me that California is quite likely to abuse it. But for those of you who are smugly thinking that, I would point out that there are lots of other states in the other direction that might do this against, say, the NAACP or, or the ACLU and might go after their donors. It's not like this is a, a, a one-way ratchet. It's we have states that span the political spectrum and consider different groups their enemies. So uh, I wouldn't be too smug about it just being California. There are lots of other places too. That feeds directly into the next question actually from Robert Fitzpatrick. He asks, will we see disclosure laws regarding so-called domestic terrorist groups? Um, I don't think you'll need disclosure laws. I think if you have a group that is smelling and looking like a domestic terrorist group, that there will be a targeted request for disclosure on who is funding that and where's the money's going and how's the money being spent. And, and this case doesn't talk about targeted requests for disclosure, where you had some probable cause or reasonable suspicion to believe something weird is going on. I mean, that's arguably more of a Fourth Amendment problem uh, or sort of an interaction between Fourth Amendment and First Amendment problems. But, but I think once you get into domestic terrorist groups, you are, in fact, rather more narrowly tailored. And I suppose if you suddenly decided that anybody who supports the Republican Party is a domestic terrorist group, well, yes, that would be overbroad. But if you pick and choose like the, the pride, the proud boys or something like that. And you said, I have reason to believe because of X, Y, and Z. I think you meet the probable cause standard and you're in, you're in uh, and you get to demand disclosure and you get to search and you get to probably wiretap them for that matter. So I, I wouldn't worry so much about disclosure there when the probable cause standard, which is not unduly burdensome for and law enforcement uh, makes, makes much more targeted means available. Great. Um, Jeffrey Wood asks, I think it's a follow on question from his first first question. He asks, um, private right of action if the DOJ won't act. So, for example, disclosure. Do you have a comment or a thought there? So is it uh, create a private right of action against 
state entities who who, who improperly disclose them. And I suppose there's a, a 1983-esque kind of action where uh, a state entity violates your First Amendment rights by improperly disclosing private information that they have no right to disclose. Uh, and so I suppose there's a constitutional claim. I suppose Congress could pass uh, a, a broader cause of action, but but I think that would require a more legislative uh, fix. If, I'm not a 1983 person, so I can't exactly say 1983, 1981, whether those kinds of claims would be viable. Somebody on the line or watching probably knows better than I do, but but I would think it would require a statutory fix to get there. Uh, and maybe you could, but certainly not today. <laughs> not in today's political climate could you pass something like that. And a follow up on a follow up question to that, I think Jeffrey Wood again says key tam slash whistleblower, maybe a whistleblower statute. Yeah, very possibly. Uh, you can have whistleblowing if, if it was sort of swept under the rug. Uh, like I said, I'm not an expert on the sort of the nuts and bolts of how one hunts this down and squashes these kinds of violations. But step one is establishing that it's a violation. And I think this is at least helpful step one. Uh, and then you'd have to go on and on. Whether or not there are legislative fixes is, you know, at the moment, at least beyond the scope of my sort of thinking about it because I'm an appellate guy more than I am a go out and sue them kind of guy. Great, and now a question from, from an anonymous attendee actually um, asks or really comments the worry that targeted disclosures of political dissidents in courts then rubber stamp fishing expeditions into conservative groups under the guise of an undefined term, domestic terrorism. Uh, I, I don't doubt that that governments, California state governments, federal government, all governments uh, go on these kinds of targeted fishing expeditions. It's incredibly hard to make out a claim of prosecutorial targeting and discrimination. It's basically a discrimination claim. Um, you know, uh, I don't doubt for a minute that it happens, but I don't doubt for a minute that it happens in both directions. I think you probably could see this under flip-flopping administrations of different political stripes and flavors and aggressiveness, that they go after the folks that they view as the greatest threats. And a long history of prosecutorial discretion and investigative discretion makes it incredibly hard to make that claim. You have to almost do it retrospectively with a, a massive showing of a massively disproportional targeting, right? So, so this reminds me of like disproportionate impact claims in other discrimination circumstances, in voting circumstances, in racial discrimination circumstances, in gender or age discrimination circumstances, that just showing uh, an imbalance between the results. So they went after only 10 Democratic groups, but 20 Republican groups. Those are terrible, hard to make claims. And you generally have to show purpose and intent, uh, which I think is right. Because at the end of the day, it's just so much speculation to burden, to bog down the world with that. Uh, I think if you had smoking guns and emails that said, uh, these guys are lobbying against our policies, let's go after their donors, then sure, you'd have a great claim of intentional discrimination uh, and intentional violation of the First Amendment. But short of that, I'm, I'm terribly reluctant to, to create sort of open warfare <clears throat> by the public to say, well, it wasn't exactly balanced today. It wasn't exactly this, it wasn't exactly that. And I think all of you should be incredibly reluctant to, to have the public Shanghai the courts into a never ending war uh, on everything. That's just not helpful. Great, and now a question from Mr. Robert Fitzpatrick, again on the domestic terrorism concern. So any group the government says is a domestic terrorist group could be forced to disclose who has given it, who has given it money. Does so it had you listened to me before, I actually expressly said that that's not the case. Uh, right. So please listen. Uh, what I said was that if they over broadly define domestic terrorist group, that would be a problem. If they said anybody who contributes to the Republican Party's domestic terrorist group or anybody who supports Republican views, then yes, that would be wildly overbroad. And I imagine a violation of the First Amendment because uh, you would be basing it upon their views. But if it's based on anybody whose members uh, have uh, called for the overthrow of the U.S. government through violent means, uh, you'd probably be a little bit better off. And I suspect that there are plenty of groups that you could find that have done that. And so, no, not anybody who you call a domestic terrorist, but anybody who you have actually a meaningful basis 
for doing that, which is the Fourth Amendment standard, uh, probable cause, you would actually need some evidence. And eventually somebody would challenge the search warrant. Somebody would challenge the prosecution. Somebody would challenge the demand for information in an as applied way uh, that would have all of these concerns. And that would, would build upon this kind of case law. I think I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask another question of my own. Um, I was curious about if it were not the donor lists that were being requested by by a state attorney general, what if it were the um, like the membership list? Does the new standard that's articulated by the court apply to like an anonymous anonymous society where the the membership lists were being requested by a state attorney general? I would think membership lists would be protected better than donor lists because donor lists at least have some tangential relationship to fraud. And so particularly if you had a targeted donor request, uh, you could worry about there being passed through donors, there being loans and paybacks. You could worry in individual cases that there is abuse or money laundering or any of number of things that donors can do, theoretically, uh, that you might have some individualized suspicion about. But for membership lists, then you're getting really solidly into the NAACP uh, case. And I think it would be harder to articulate a need for that membership list. Uh, and so it's hard to imagine that surviving either as applied or on its face, uh, because I can't even imagine what the state would claim was the critical thing. Now, I suppose if it was, if you had a group that was constantly calling for, let's overthrow the government, let's shoot people, let's kill the vice president, let's hang them high. Well, maybe I want to know who your members are. <laughs> sure. I, I mean, that might get you over the hump, at least a probable cause. Um, and so, and I see a, one of the commenters sort of says, what about BLM? Is it a terrorist group? Well, I suppose it would depend. Uh, if the answer is, has BLM called for the bombing of federal buildings and the murder of the vice president, et cetera, et cetera, maybe. I don't actually think that there's evidence of that. I certainly think there's evidence that people at protests have committed crimes. And I think that's true of right-wing protests and left-wing protests and, and other protests. And I think there are pickpockets at protests. And, and there's just a, an attribution problem of saying that somebody who showed up at a BLM protest and committed a crime means BLM's a terrorist group. Well, that's a problem. And I wouldn't want to say that about BLM. And I wouldn't want to say that about groups that advocate for, uh, you know, <laughs> no affirmative action or that protested the election. Just because you showed up at this rally doesn't mean that you were one of the jackasses calling for bombing a building or killing a vice president or killing anybody. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a little leery of, of uh, sort of guilt by association in the sense that you showed up at a rally, as opposed to guilt by I'm a member of the group and the group's express platform is overthrow the United States government through violent means. Well, then I've voluntarily associated myself with a very express call to violence. And maybe there's some investigation that you need if some of that looks like it's imminent. But but for the BLM example, I, I, I would I would think that the government would need a lot more evidence that BLM itself was promoting the violent activities, not merely that hangers on uh, somehow engaged in violence. Great. Um, I think that we are drawing close to the end of the program this afternoon. Um, any other final questions from attendees? And if not, then I will hand the floor over to you, Eric, for any closing comments. Well, I mean, my, my overall closing comment is that I think it's important for people on both sides of the fence to understand that just because you don't like the group targeted today, just because, or just because you do like the group targeted today, doesn't mean that you shouldn't stick with the sort of the procedural approach that this applies on both sides of the fence. And so I see people complaining about BLM. I see, you know, I hear in the media people complaining about people who are protesting uh, different government actions here and there. We should move past that. The First Amendment is valuable, not just because it protects you, but because it actually protects your enemies. Because at the end of the day, you're not going to be in power every day. You're not going to be in power every administration. You're going to be on the bottom side of that boot eventually. And just because you like using the boot while you're on the top, I think that's short-sighted. I think that is exactly what the First Amendment is there for, is to stop such short-sightedness. And we should be a little more concerned with an even-handed application, even if you don't like BLM or, or whoever it is, we should protect the First Amendment. I think the ACLU of your got it right. Uh, and the fact that the ACLU today is a little hinkier about defending people it doesn't like, doesn't mean that us on the 
the, the libertarian right or the, even the right right uh, shouldn't like go back to those principles and actually fight for reasonable principles rather than take the convenience of complaining about it when they're pissing on us, but ignoring it when we're pissing on them. Uh, these are principles worth fighting for. They're principles worth it in the First Amendment context. They're worth it in the Second Amendment context. And quite frankly, they're worth it in the Fourth Amendment context and, and in the due process context. And you may not like a bunch of other rights out there that you think are made up, but fight the, the predicate. Don't fight the application. Don't say, well, given that I don't like the predicate, I'm going to cheat on everything after that. Go back to the predicate where you disagree and fight that. Don't fight the scrutiny levels and the, the, the genuineness of applying tiers of scrutiny. That would be the lesson that I would take from this. I think it's a good lesson. Uh, and I think if uh, Chief Justice Roberts' uh, version of scrutiny or even more aggressive version of scrutiny that some of the other justices might prefer were applied to lots of constitutional rights, we'd all be better off. That's my, that's my closing views. Fantastic, thank you. Well, on behalf of the Federalist Society, I wanna thank our expert, Mr. Eric Jaffe for the benefit of his valuable time and expertise this afternoon. And I want to thank our audience for participating and sending in your questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you.